Our presenters tonight are Keith and Holly Howe from North Platte, Nebraska. I think probably a lot of you in the room know them from the state, uh, Sudan, and so forth. And those of you who don't, will I am They're owners of photographic images in North Platte, Nebraska. They own the studio for 10 years. Uh, they'll tell us more about that, I'm sure. Keith serves on the board of directors of PPM. Um, Holly, are you one of the She's, she's always there, so. Yeah, she's on the board. Keith's on the board, but she tells him what to do. I tell him how to vote. Keith, as mentioned before, will receive his master's degree at the National Convention this year in Dallas. Hopefully, unless we decide that he speaks. Write lots of letters. No. They presented programs on the state and regional level. They're scheduled to uh, have a presentation at Art of America this year. The uh, name of the program tonight was Making Dollars and Cents of Wedding Photography. Let's give a warm welcome to Keith and Holly Howell.
lot of variety in Omaha how it's done. I would assume that if I went into every one of your studios, what you offer me for weddings would be different. But it seems pretty standard throughout the state that most people have packages. And when we opened our studio 10 years ago, we thought, well, you know, this is what you do. You have a package for weddings. And it's so many 8 by 10s and so many 4 by 5s or so many 5 by 7s or whatever. And um, so that's what we did, you know. And well, you know, how much are we going to charge for it? Well, Keith works for Denny Photography and Carney for three years before we opened our own studio. Well, we didn't want to charge as much as him, so we just lowered our prices a little bit from Denny's and, you know, made a price list, and that was it. And we had a package. And after a couple of years of doing that, I found that that didn't really work too great because the brides would come in and, and, you know, our package, I think it was 28 by 10s and 20 previews, or proofs, or originals, or whatever you would call them. And it was really funny, but that's what the bride got then. You know, she got 28 by 10s and 20 previews. And she didn't buy anything else. You know, maybe her mother got something and her, her mother-in-law. But that's what was in the bride's album. And, you know, it never occurred to me that maybe they thought that's what they were supposed to buy until we'd been in business a few years and I would run into these people um, socially or um, otherwise and I would see them in the conversation in terms of their wedding and they'd say, well, you know, I always wish that we had gotten a bigger package because I really would have liked to got more than what was in that package. And I thought, well, you know, you can get more, but, but we were kind of telling them that that's what they were supposed to buy and they weren't supposed to buy anything else. It made perfect sense to me that they could get more prints, but it didn't to them. So I thought, well, I don't like this package idea because it's, you know, telling them this is what you're supposed to buy. So then we thought, well, we'll try an a la carte system. You know, it's, it's like you have a, a a la carte or a minimum order, I guess is what I mean to say. And it would be like, you know, you just, you guarantee me that you'll have this minimum dollar amount and then we'll just do all this tarping and then you go from there. Well, what I found out happened was I didn't have any way to qualify my customer. Um, brides would come in and they'd say, yeah, this is great. I want you to stay till 2 in the morning, and I want you to take all these dance poses, and then they wouldn't buy any of that stuff. You know, they, they um, wanted, because all they were committed to was that minimum order, they wanted me to do everything for them, but then when it came down to time to, to order, you know, they just got the minimum or just a little bit more. So I didn't really like that um, minimum order business either because, you know, Keith was staying at a wedding till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and I was home alone and I didn't like that. Or I was with him and I was real tired and grouchy the next morning and that didn't work out too well either. So the next thing that we went to, this is when I got to check my watch, I know how long I can talk. The next thing that we went to was what we call the plan system and that's what we use today and I am sold on it. It works really well for us. Kind of a combination of a package and a minimum order. Um, what happens is when a bride comes into our studio, she agrees to a minimum order. But we have a lot of different minimums or plans depending upon how much photography she wants. Um, it works really well because, first of all, it pre qualifies my customer. If the bride comes in and she wants dance coverage, she has to go to the next higher plan. So, or if she wants an unlimited coverage, she has to go on higher. So I kind of know in advance whether this gal is a picture person or not. If she's somebody that wants a lot of photography, she's probably going to pick a larger plan. If she's somebody that just wants a minimum coverage, she's going to pick a smaller plan. Am I making that clear? Yeah, okay, everybody nod. So, not not off. So the plan system really works well, works well for us because, like I said, it, um, it qualifies my customer. If we have to stay till 1 o'clock in the morning when the dance gets over, she, I know that I'm going to have an order at least up here because they had to agree in the, in the beginning to purchase that order to get me to stay that long. The other thing that it does is different from packages that I like is that the couple custom designs their album. They're not tied into a set number of 8 by 10, a set number of 4 by 5, whatever. It's whatever they want as long as they spend a certain dollar on it. The other, another benefit to this system that I really like that I didn't think about in the beginning, it just kind of came about, 
up is you can't compare apples to oranges. So when a bride comes into my studio and I visit with her, and she has my little price list to take out with her, it's a whole different way of looking at it than the other studio in town. So she can't look at it and say, okay, here I have to spend X amount of dollars and I'm getting so many 8 by 10, so many 4 by 5 And here for $20 more, I'm getting one more 8 by 10, but two less 4 by 5 You know, it's a whole different system. So it makes it difficult for her to compare between the two studios. Um, the other thing that, about it, excuse me, is that it's, it's different in that she can't compare price-wise, but it's also different in just the fact that it's different. It sets me apart. Um, Keith and I gave a program over in, in Iowa a few weeks ago, and one of the other speakers was talking about senior photography. He said he really didn't like packages for seniors, but he guessed he had to do them because everybody in Denver was doing packages. Well, for me, if everybody was doing packages, that's the reason I wouldn't do packages, because I would be different. So anyway, that's another benefit of it, is it, it makes you different. Anything that you can do that makes you different. If the other studios in town were spending seven or eight bucks a shot on a really fancy printed price list, I'd probably have an inexpensive one, just because it would be different. If, um, the fact is that they use very inexpensive printed material, so my printed material is pretty expensive to produce, because it's different. And that's the whole the whole thing that'll set you apart. Anything you can do to make you different. Um, okay. The, the secret to making this system work for you is and why it works better than a plan system is that the difference is not in the amount of prints that they're buying. Before when I had packages, the bride couldn't really see a benefit to move up in the package other than getting more photographs. You know, before the wedding, when you tell her, well, you're going to get 50 photographs, you're going to get 75 photographs, you're going to get 100 photographs, you know, she can't envision other than she knows, well, I want a full length of my, my husband and I, and I want one of the ceremony, one of the cake cutting. You know, 50 sounds like a lot of photographs to her in advance. And she can't even begin to imagine that she wants to want 75 or 100. So, all she, you know, th that doesn't make any difference. It isn't a benefit to her to get a, a bigger package. But on a plan system, it is a benefit of her to get a bigger plan because we start adding on more coverage. For example, in our studio, a standard plan is just, you know, the groups, the ceremony, the cake cutting, boom. We move up the notch, we include the dance. Um, maybe instead of photographing the bride with her mom and dad, we do the bride with her mom and dad, the bride with her mother, the bride with her father. You know, as she moves up, not only is it, obviously she's going to get greater numbers of photographs, but she's going to get more coverage. Am I making sense? Everybody nod. <laughs> Okay, so now once I figured out that I'm going to package or offer my wedding and plans rather than packages, I had to find out a way to figure out how much I was going to charge. Now, there's a lot of theories of how to charge for weddings. Um, my theory was always to pick a number out of the air. That was always how kind of how I did it um, after we've been in business a few years and I had quit. <coughs> And I had quit just copying off of what Danny did, only just a little bit less. Then there's the other theory, which is get your receptionist to call every studio in town and see what they charge. That's a good one. I think a lot of studios use that, judging by the phone calls that we get. But um, I finally sat down one day and I figured out a formula to, fig to know how much to charge for a wedding. And he's going to send a little handout, and I want to go through this with you. Because I did this over in Iowa, and they came up with a figure of $2,500 was their minimum wedding price. So we're going to go through this real quick. Holly, it's, a, Holly, it's in front. What? It's in front. The switch. The switch. Side. The other side. The front. Uh -huh. yeah.
Okay. Now, if anybody in the audience is worried, because you always hear this about how you can't talk about prices from the platform, the reason that is, is not because people they won't let you, it's because the Federal Trade Commission has called that price fixing. So if any of you have already wondered why people they won't let us talk about price, that's it. However, we can talk about theoretical prices, and that's what we're going to do here. We're going to figure out if all of us open the studio tomorrow together, we're all going in partnership, and we have to make our wedding prices, this is what we're going to figure out what we're going to charge. Okay, first of all, I need to know how much are we going to pay a photographer per hour? Somebody give me a figure. $50. $50? Is that agreeable? Keith doesn't get paid 50 bucks an hour. You need an extra Not even when he's taking pictures. I just want to know, if you're going to hire somebody that's going to go out and photograph a wedding for you, how much are you going to pay and what's his hourly wage going to be while he's at the wedding? $30? Is that acceptable? How do you eliminate that after being there at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning taking pictures? Compare yourself to just a certain amount of time. Not having to be there all day long. Run that by me again. How do you evaluate a certain price level not having higher enough so that you can uh, only stay there at 4 or 5 hours but have to be there until 4 or 5 in the morning? You're charging $35 an hour. Well, I don't understand no, we, what you're asking. We don't charge $35. No, 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 no. She's trying to tell you how to figure whether how you're making your money to your money or not. Okay. Okay. I want to know saying, how much yeah, per hour are you going to pay so these people to do the thing? Right. Right. <laughs> okay. okay, how many want to make it say 50? Good round figure. 50 dollars? Okay. He doesn't get paid that much. Okay, how much are you going to pay? Are you going to, we're going to take in our studio, we're going to take an assistant. Now this person doesn't know how to run the camera, so they're going to get less. $10? We're moving down this end of the station. Okay. Okay. How much are you going to pay somebody that works, a clerical person that works in the studio? Six. Six? Okay. Now, when the bride first comes in, the first day that you've never seen her before, and she walks into your studio to talk to you about weddings, how much time are you going to spend with her? An hour? An hour? Okay. And that's going to be the clerical person, probably? That's okay. That's six bucks. Okay. Now, when she comes back the second time, which usually happens for us to book the wedding, how much time then? Another hour? Half hour? Half? And is that going to be the clerical person again? Probably. Okay. Now it's the week before the wedding, and she's going to come in and talk to the, talk to somebody about wedding photography. You know, about her wedding in particular. How much time is that going to take? Now, and that's got to be with a photographer, right? So that's got to be at this 50 bucks an hour. Okay, now it's time, it's the day of the wedding and you got to get ready to go. How much time are you going to allow to pack up your equipment, get in the car, and drive to the church? An hour? Okay, and that's both the photographer and the assistant. So that's 60 bucks just before you can get there. Okay, how much time in an average wedding? Six hours. Six hours? Ooh, I don't want to work that long. Okay, six hours. And that's the photographer and the assistant, so that's 360 bucks, right? Okay, the previews come back from the lab, and you have to get them ready to go out to the client. Get them numbered or whatever you're going to do with them. How much time for that? Now, one hour? Okay. And that's the clerical person again, right? Six. Oh. I'm sorry. In mine, we pay the clerical person five dollars. We our wages aren't as high out there. Okay. Now, when the bride comes in for no for the for the we call this the sales appointment. When she comes in to pick up her previews. And you're going to give them to her and tell her all about it and try and get her to, you know, tell her what to do. How much time? Half hour? Half that sounds good. Because really, if you haven't sold her by now, you know, you're really not going to do much selling at this point. And again, I think that's probably the clerical person. Mike, you might notice here, this is where I want you to use your calculator. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay, when the bride comes in to give you her order and tell you what she's going to buy, this is my favorite. An hour and a half? <laughs> okay, I heard 25 minutes and I had two hours. Is an hour acceptable? Okay. Okay. So that's the clerical person again? Okay. I'm trying to keep this cheap for you. Yeah, okay. Now, production. What I mean by this is when the... When the oh, wait a second, I did this wrong. This should be an hour and a half here. Yeah, I'm sorry. What I meant by order placing was ordering it from the lab. How long does that take? to get the negatives ready for the lab. I can't hear it. Hello. <laughs>
Okay, how much is it going to cost you for reprints that you ordered from the lab for the 8x10s and 5x7s and stuff? Just on the bride album is what I'm trying to figure right now. Hundred bucks for the reprint. Yeah. Hundred bucks for the reprint. Yeah. Hundred bucks for the reprint. No, I'm talking about just the bride album. Just the bride and room's album. So I got to order, you know, 30, 40, 8x10s and stuff. I think you're going to buy it. Just the bride. Just the bride. For just the bride dog? Sure. Okay, just your cost for the bride dog. 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 Okay, just your cost for the
I would save maybe a, two hours or what over here, but I would increase my cost over here. See, it's just a little formula for you to figure out what you need to charge. You know, Keith doesn't get paid 50 bucks an hour. You know, he gets, when I'm figuring this out, he doesn't get paid anything, actually. He just gets a profit at the end. When I'm figuring this out, I figure this time, for me to hire a photographer in North Platte, Nebraska, I figure it'd be $25 an hour is what I'd have to pay. You know, maybe in Omaha you'd have to pay 50 But anyway, my whole point with this is this is just a tool that you can use to figure out what you need to charge in your studio. Okay, that was on your front sheet. Now this is the fun part, I think. You can figure out what you're going to charge per print. How much each print's going to be. So, what did we have? 1222? Let's just say 1200 here. Okay. Now, if we're going to charge the bride $1,200 for her minimum order, we need to know about how many prints do we think would be a fair amount for her to get in her album for that price? Ten? That's good. I can live with that. I might not book any weddings, but the one I do book, I'm going to make a lot of money. <laughs> so, Eighty prints? Okay. Eight by, total, total number of prints. Yeah, 80? You think 80? I think that sounds like a good number. Mike, can you divide what number by 80 for me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 15. Okay. That means that your estimate, your approximate price for your print has to be $15. If you want the bride to have 80 prints in her album and you're going to sell it for $1,200, then your approximate price. Right now, I'm just saying overall. Okay, <laughs> then from there, we're going to figure out what each of our individual sizes are going to be. Okay, so you can see how I did this. I call this my X plus one theory of print pricing. So for my 8 by 10 price, I'm going to take my estimated print price and add two bucks. So my 8 by 10s are going to sell for 17. My 5 by 7s, I add 1, is going to sell for 16. And my 4 by 5s, or proofs, or originals, or whatever, is going to sell for 15. You got that? We do not have previews. Yeah, well, I'm going to get to that. Are, are you done with this? Can I turn this off and let you play one of this? Okay, you know, a couple of years ago, I was, or probably four or five years ago, I was having a lot of trouble with the brides that come in and they buy like 80. 4x5 or 80 proofs or whatever you would call them. And they take them, put them in this album and it looked crappy. Page after page of eight prints. Where's that water? What? Where's that water? And I really didn't like that. I mean, you know, I wanted to make it money, but it wasn't personally satisfying to me. And I found that in order for me to want to keep it, you know, all the 4x5s to go out. So I was talking to David Bentley from Missouri, and he said, well, just make the 4 by 5s almost the same price as the 8 by 10 And I mean, like, I was rolling on the floor. I said, oh, I can't do this. It's never going to work. I'm never going to go to the wedding. You know, they're going to run me out of town on the rail. So he told me this price five years ago, and I think it took me two years to try it. And it was really amazing. I didn't quit booking the wedding. Nobody said, my goodness, your 4 by 5s are sure expensive. You know, I mean, I had one or two people, but they were the same people that were saying that when the 4 by 5s were only a third or a fourth the price, or a third to a half the price of the 8 by 10. And so I thought about it a little more, and I thought, well, you know, there's not a real lot of difference in the price of an 8 by 10 on a wedding, the price of an 8 by 10 and the price of a 4 by 5 from the lab. And I don't know about you, but it takes about the same amount of time to spray a 4 by 5 as it does to spray an 8 by 10. And it takes about the same amount of time to dust spot it. And it takes about the same amount of time to stick it in the album. So the only real difference between a 4x5 and an 8x10 were the few cents difference from the lab. So I thought, well, you know, why should there be a lot of difference? Why should an 8x10 be twice as much as a 4x5? There's really no reason. You gotta watch my lunch. I got 15 more minutes and then it's your turn. 
so so I started uh, we started doing this and what happened was brides started buying the size that they wanted the print to be rather than the cheapest size because think about it if a bride got X number of dollars to spend and she wants to get as many pictures as she can for that amount of money if the 4x5s are a lot less expensive, it only makes sense that she can get all 4x5s because then she can get more pictures. This way, if she wants to save money, changing everything to a 4x5, you know, if she's got 80 prints in her album and she makes them all 4x5s instead of 5x7s or 8x10s, you know, she's only saving 80 bucks or 160 bucks. You know, she's not saving very much money by going to a smaller size. So in order to save money, she has to eliminate photography, eliminate print. Well, she's a lot more reluctant to do that than she is just to get it in a smaller size. Also, like she started buying the sizes that were appropriate to the print, you know. Instead of getting Lynn Barnes is the first one that will tell you this. When he got married, he worked for a studio, and the photographer just took the pictures and then gave Lynn the album. And his album is so funny to look at because it's all 8 by 10 And here you've got the cake table people in an 8 by 10 and here you've got the guest book person in an 8 by 10 You know, that doesn't look right that size. You know, I'm also one for bigger pictures, but those should be the smaller prints in the album. And the group photographs, or the full length of the couple, or the um, nifty romantic poses should be the larger sizes. So the bride started buying like I said, she started getting the size that she wanted for this particular print, rather than the cheaper size. The next thing that it enabled, it, it enabled us to do was to include the wedding album. Um, you notice on here, I figured the wedding album in. Well, we used to sell the wedding album separate, and everybody said, oh, sell the album separate, you'll make more money, you can add on $100 or $200 or whatever. Well, we're just not good enough salespeople. If the bride was going to spend another 200 bucks, she was going to buy more pictures. She wasn't going to buy that album. And I got real tired of my photography, or Keith's photography, or whosoever it was, you know. We went down the street to the other studio and, and stuck their rejects out of the trash. But I got real tired of my stuff going out in a box, because I knew darn good and well that she was going to take it home and put it in one of those lace things that Aunt Mabel made, you know, that magnetic stuff. And I did it wasn't personally satisfying. I'm going to go, in my second career, I'm going to make that an album. Because somewhere, everybody's got one. But it wasn't personally satisfying. Remember when I said it has to be personally satisfying to you. You have to feel good about it to want to keep doing it. So I just, just it just set wrong with me that those prints were going on in a box. I knew when she showed them to her friend that they were going to look terrible, just loose in that box that they were going to look so much better if they were in an album. So because I'm charging so much more money for the 4x5 than I was before, now think about it. If, if you raise your 4x5 price, think about what your 8x10 price is now, and then raise your 4x5 price up, up so it's only like $2 less. And I'm guessing that we're talking maybe a 6 7 8 $9 price increase on that 4x5. doesn't take the sale of very many 4x5s to cover the cost of the album. You know, in our case, we figured that we had to sell 12 4x5s at the new prices to for us to be able to give the album to the bride and have it paid for. But is your price for the album included in your pictures? It sure is. On our plan system, they agree to purchase, you can look at the price list over here, they agree to purchase a certain dollar amount of photography and then we have our print prices. So if they want all 8 by 10s all they have to do is take that dollar amount divided by the 8 by 10 price, which is a simplistic way. They don't do that, they get other sizes. And then the album is included at no charge. But I'm making enough more money on my 4 by 5s that I can afford to do that. Where if they were, you know, half the price of an 8 by 10 I couldn't afford it. The other thing that happens is Aunt Mabel is going to buy one 4 by 5 of her with the cake she made, or the maid of honor is going to buy one 4x5 of her and the bride, regardless of what the 4x5 price is, they're going to buy one of the cheapest size. So it doesn't matter if you're charging 
this price down here for four by five, or if you're charging this price up here, they're still going to get one four by five. So you're not going to, my big fear was I was going to lose all my reorders because my four by fives were going to be too expensive. But that didn't happen. What did happen to my reorders was parents started getting five by seven parent albums instead of four by five albums because there was very little difference if it was a 20 or 30 print parent album, it was only 20 or $30 more to get five by seven than four by five. So suddenly instead of the parents walking around with this four by five album, they're walking around with a five by seven. And you know, it's really funny because Keith and I were over in Iowa and I was talking about this, and I said, but you know, I still have, I'm still not selling five by seven albums, or excuse me, I'm still not selling eight by 10 parent albums. And I went, like that. I don't have it on my price list. No wonder I'm not selling it. So the next thing I'm going to do on my new price list is I'm going to put 8x10 parent albums on there, and they're not going to look very much more than my 4x5 albums, so hopefully I'm going to start selling them too. Did I make that clear? Okay. Let me see where I'm at on my notebook. Everybody nod. Okay. Uh, can we take a hold on and we'll watch you talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> If he wants to marry. Just a second, I gotta throw my cards right here. Okay, one more thing about including the albums that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, I'm gonna get that the next thing I'm gonna do. Brides start buying to fit the album rather than just buying photographs. If they're getting an album, and I'm going to show you here in a minute my layout sheet, which is also in the handout. They start buying to fit the album rather than just photographs. And that seems like such a simple thing, but if you notice some of the albums over here, um, how we always try to have facing pages coordinate and print facing in and um, a balance of not all 5 by 7 and all 4 by 5 I think in one of these albums, The Outdoor Wedding, there's a page with one five by seven, and that was done in 1986, I think, so it's a pretty old album. But if you notice all the other ones, these aren't signed albums, but there's always two five by sevens to a page, or four four by fives. They always fit what the industry has told us we have to sell per page. Keith and I are going to try and get Art Leather to make us a page that has, what did we figure, eight wallets? Because that's... I just want to do that because nobody else is doing it, so it's going to make me different. But anyway, to get back to my point, the, the bride is going to buy to fit the pages in the album. And you're not going to be stuck when the prints come back from the lab with one 5x7 that needs to go on a page, or two 4x5s, and you've only sold two 4x5s, but it's still taking up a whole page, which still is costing you as much. I'd much rather put four 4x5s four on a page to help pay for that page rather than just two four by five. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by that? Everybody on. <laughs> okay. Then <clears throat> so that's really that nice That really makes a difference in the amount of print you're gonna sell when the bride starts to buy for the album. Because she starts to think about a story rather than just print. And this is when you'll start selling. Keith's going to talk about something we call the details or our transition pages. And when you get the bride to buy for her album is when you start selling the transition pictures, which, where's that? Did you just see the, the champagne bottle and the carriage seat? That's what we call a transition picture, that or a detailed picture. That moves you from one point in the story to the next point. Um, some of our albums will have a close-up of maybe the guest book table. Maybe that moves you. Or um, the, um, I'm trying to think of it right. Um, an album that he's going to be entering this year in competition, they left in a vintage automobile, and we have the bride's bouquet next to the hood ornament. And we have a close-up of the hood ornament of this vintage car. What if, I don't know what it was. It's got cranes on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Before, a bride never bought that kind of stuff. We took it and we really needed to get all excited. Oh, look at this little thing. I think this is so neat. 
but they didn't buy it because they were just buying photographs. Once they start buying for the album, they start seeing the value of those kind of photographs that move them from one point in the story to the next. And I'll let you talk more about that. But the next thing I want to show you, and it's in your little handout, is if you guys don't do anything else, if you don't use any idea that I give you, or any idea Keith gives you, if you take this layout thing home and Xerox it off and start using it, you will make more money. It is just phenomenal. I couldn't believe, you know, somebody told me to do this and I thought, oh yeah, sure, sure, this is gonna work. And I tried it and it worked. But then I, I always did a layout where I just listed the numbers and told the bride, okay, this is how I think you should lay out your album. And I gave it to him with their previews. And I just had a list of the numbers. And then Jerry and Terry Reinbold gave a program over in Iowa that I attended. And they had this little layout sheet, and that's who I stole this from. There's not a lot of things that I have original. Most everything is stolen, but I even stole Keith from Patty. He can tell you the whole story. Not Tom's Patty, different Patty. Okay, this is, I'm sure, you know, if you know anything about weddings, you know what this is. This is just a little diagram of the pages. So when the previews come back, and Barb that works for she numbers them all, and then I sit down with the previews, and I put them in a, in a wedding album layout. And the first time I did that, it took me like an hour and a half. Now I can do it in 20 minutes. And if you can spend 20 minutes and increase your sale by $300, I mean, that's worth 20 minutes. And it doesn't cost you anything except five cents for the Xerox copy of this and 20 minutes of your time. Which out in our flat, we ain't got any people, so I'm not doing anything anyway. I might as well spend the 20 minutes doing this little layout sheet. So what I do is I just take the previews, I put them in order, maybe, and then I write on here, like, okay, um, the opening page. And we kind of have a tendency in our studio, because this is just kind of what he does, is the, the first page of the album is real often a, a profile of the bride and a profile of the groom. So maybe this is 9 and this is 17. Then here we're going to have 86 and 43. And here we're going to have 4, 4 by 5. And here we're going to have 2, 5 by 7 horizontal. And here we're going to have a vertical 5 by 7 and 2, 4 by 5. Do you get the idea of what I'm doing? Uh, maybe this is 18, 22. Is that clear what I'm doing? Okay. I will go over that. What this helps do is tell the couples, you know, pre-planned sizes all the time. How many, yeah. the How many couples have put together a wedding album before? Well, you know, I would say probably 20% of our weddings are second weddings. So that many of them did it the first time, so maybe they have some idea, but they still, you know. I mean, think about it. Didn't the first car you ever bought wasn't it a lemon? Uh, so yeah. pre I'm giving them the page along with the cover letter you have in your little handout thing. And a blank one. And I also give them a blank one so they can make changes. And we have word processing on our computer, so I just go in there and I just change the names and hit the button and I print that letter out on a piece of our studio stationery and I stick it in with this stuff. So you see how I'm filling it out. Okay, the secret to make this work is Let's say we told the bride and groom we figured out it has to be $1,200 is what that price is. When I figure this out, I'm going to make sure that this price down here totals up to $1,600. So that the balance, when I subtract that $1,200, so that the balance due it's however much I decided I want to get milk out of them with more money. And make it a little higher than what your goal is. Yeah, if you want to increase the bride and groom's orders by $300, make that $400. If your goal is to increase it by $600, make that $700. You know, make it a little bit higher than what you really believe they're going to buy, and then you'll be pleasantly surprised when they do. Now, somebody asked me how often the bride and groom get exactly what I put on here. Not real often, but the dollar amount is real often almost exact. They'll switch poses. They'll switch poses, or maybe I've selected something that I feel should be an eight by 10, and she didn't particularly care for her expression in that pose, and she'll make it a four by five. 
or maybe there's something that technically wasn't real good, it's a little underexposed or a little out of focus. <laughs> then my time's up. <laughs> and I didn't feel that I wanted it in 8x10, but she doesn't know, you know. I'm sure there's lots of photographs up here. In this one, the, the, the lake is running uphill or downhill or something, but she doesn't know. She thinks it's gorgeous. She wants an 8x10 of it in her book. You know, we get concerned about that stuff, but oftentimes they don't know. So anyway. Holly? Uh, yeah? The balance of the suggested layout is on top of what you... Of what, of of what they've already paid. Our plans are prepaid before I'm, we... I'll get to um, run over that in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't do it all the time. Yeah. 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 No. Okay. I didn't say it. I didn't okay. an argument. Okay. No, 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 no. We were over and I, we were fighting back and forth, and I said to the audience, I said, wouldn't you love to see what's going to go on in the car on the way home? <laughs> okay. So anyway, I got this all laid out. Then down here I have so many 8 by 10s you know, say 22 8 by 10s um, 16 5 by 7 and 46 4 by 5 or whatever it is, times the dollar amount, blah, 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 total it up, put the tax on there, mileage of 30, then I subtract the previous deposit and I leave the balance for the suggested layout. Now, the one thing I will caution you about, I had a very irate bride because she felt that I had misled her in it. I had, but not intentionally. Nowhere on here, Say, say 1200 is what they had already paid, and 400 is how much more I want to get. Nowhere on here does it say 1600 Because I didn't want to plant the seed in their head of, oh my God, look how much I'm spending. All I wanted them to see is that it was $400 more. And I did one once where she had paid me X amount of dollars, and Keith had done a phenomenal job on her wedding. It was just beautiful. And I just couldn't get rid of anything when I was trying to lay it out. And what I came up for the balance for the suggested layout was X plus $27. So she thought all she owed me to get what I had written was $27, where she really owed me X plus $27. And she went ahead and did it. You know, she said, no, no, that's what I want. But she was really mad at me. <laughs> And I ended up giving her like 50 Christmas cards or something. You know, she wouldn't tell me what she wanted to make it right. Like, you know, what can I do to make this right? And she wouldn't give me an answer. So I said, I'll tell you what, it's almost Christmas. I'll give you 50 Christmas cards and I'll give you whatever previews are left that you didn't use in your album. I'll give those to you. And, you know, I mean, the previews were just sitting in the back and the Christmas cards cost me 20 bucks. So I really wasn't, you know, she was spending enough that it was okay. But so. The reason I tell you that story is make sure that it's very clear that the balance for the suggested layout is not. What, what, what do you do with all those previews that they've used for the two or three weeks? Pardon? What do you do with all the previews that they've used for the two or three weeks? What do I do with them? I do them as four by five. We do not have previews. We don't have a preview price. It says on it, we call them originals. But it doesn't matter which column. I'm going to start calling them proofs again because that's what everybody else calls them. I might as well make my life easier. But on our price list, it says 4x5 slash original and then it has a price underneath. They don't get to keep those? No. And those are all best product last year. The reason that I, that I do it that way, that I don't have, I most, most everybody sells the proofs cheaper. But I got real tired of the bride coming in and saying, I want a proof of this of 97, and my mom wants two proofs of 97, and my grandma wants one proof of 97, and I'd have to say, no, 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 they have to get four by five. Well, why? You know, and well, you know, the proofs are made at the time of printing, they're cheaper, and blah, 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 blah. Well, I have to go back and ask them what they all want now, because that might make a difference. So that's, it was a hassle, it was a headache, so I quit doing it. And nobody, it, every once in a while, I'll have them say, well, how much are the proofs? And I'll say, well, it's either the same price as a 4 by 5 Oh, okay. You know, I've never had any reaction other than, oh, okay. You know, I just act like that's the normal way to do it. If you if you take it for granted that that's the way it's supposed to be, and you just, if I go, well, 
the proofs are the same price as the four by five, then they're going to get the idea that that's wrong, that it shouldn't be that way. But if I just say, well, they're the same price as the four by five, then they go, oh, because they don't know. They, you know, they don't. People, it's sad to say, but people don't patronize professional photographers enough to be really educated about what it is you do. At the $16 or $15 piece. Right. Now, they are, you know, when they are done, they are a four by five. They just yeah, we get some. Um, now, if the lab screwed up and printed them a little bit off color. Which never happened. Which never happened. <laughs> or, uh, no, they don't print them off color, they just don't print them to what I prefer. <laughs> or if Keith messed up the cropping a little bit and it needs to be cropped in closer. They'll never do that. <laughs> never. <laughs> or if somebody has purchased three four by five, I want, you know, like if the bride's mom, ha mom has got one four by five and the groom's mom has got one four by five, one of them is going to get the proof and the other one's going to get the, the reprint. But if if the same person has like two or three or whatever, I'm going to order them so that they're all the same, so they're exact. You know, I, I just kind of use my judgment on that. Is your album series all the same straight across with the parents and price? Is the album series, you mean the price of the print? No, the type of album. Um, as on our plan system, we start the bottom plan, it's just an art letter, plain art letter, a list of high that says wedding memories out of what I'm in front. The next plan up gets a um, cameo art letter, and the next plan up gets the heritage with the wood flap on the front. There we go. It's just another way to kind of differentiate. The parent albums, we are searching for something else, but right now we use the general product for a book. Maybe the art leather's dark and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you guys into Renaissance? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like the Renaissance real well. What I don't like is your set, a set number of pages. Oh, okay, well, maybe we'll talk about it. <laughs> okay. Is there any other questions about this before I take this off? Because I do have a couple more things I'll tell you real quick. But anyway, I never believed, I was a real skeptic, I never believed that this could make me that much more money. But it does, it really works. If you don't do anything else, just try this once. Well, try it three times, so in case it doesn't work the first time. But like I said, I just zero this off, I fill one out, and honest to God, I can do it in 20 minutes. The first time you sit down and try and lay it out, it'll probably take you longer. But you know, the first time you did anything, it's going to take you longer. What? How did you show you, The letter. Did you read that little cover letter? And I don't mess around. I know that you can get, you know, a lot of different things. But I just tell them, I don't know if in the particular cover letter you have, if it mentions that three, um, four by five can come three to a page or not. But when I'm laying it out, if it absolutely won't fit any other way than to put three four by fives on a page, then in my word processing, I just add that line on the letter. Otherwise, I don't even tell them that because I don't want them to know that. Because I don't want to have to. I want them to get a full page. I want them to buy one more print to make it fit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's all included. And like I said, all I have to do is sell. In our studio, it's, the difference is 12. I have to sell 12 4 by 5s to make up enough money to pay for the bride's album. And I always sell more than 12 4 by 5s almost always. Yeah, that's what I figured in my page. In fact, okay. Make, make the Federal Trade Commission happy there. <laughs> okay, just a second. I have a couple more things, Keith, I'm going to do real quick. Okay, money, I want to talk to you a little bit about money handling because this is my favorite thing. I just go in the cash drawer and I count the money two, three times a day. On a, on a really slow time of year, I probably count it more because I think, oh my God, isn't there really more than that? Let me count it. You know, yeah. Oh, no, the mortgage payments too. Okay, so money, money handling, I think, is really important. Um, in our studio, in order to reserve the date, the bride puts down 50% of whichever plan she has selected. So that is a quite a healthy chunk. You know, um, we don't come up 
here we figured on when we figured it out we figured twelve hundred dollars we don't come up to twelve hundred because i don't count my labor quite as if it's you know i don't he doesn't get 50 bucks an hour but he gets to hang around with me so that's fringe benefit so um that's true i don't <laughs> but um yeah, they get 50% down. So what that does is it qualifies the client. So we used to have, and I've talked to some photographers that just get $100 or $150 or whatever, and they'll get this little teeny buffer in. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I want you to do my wedding, and you know, here's a check for $50, and then you never hear from them again. Um, it doesn't matter what you charge for a wedding. All that matters is what you charge in relationship to what you want your image to be. If you want to be known as the carriage trade wedding photographer, then you better make sure that your prices are the highest prices. If you want to be known as the wedding photographer that does all the weddings, from small to big to whatever, then you need to make sure your prices reflect that in relationship to your trade area. Um, in North Platte, we have the highest wedding prices because that's where we want to be known for weddings. Is that we're the best on weddings or whatever. Um, but anyway, to get back to this, you get, you get half down, it qualifies the customer. They have to put down a big enough chunk of money in our studio that they have to be really serious about wanting us to, to you know, they have to really make a strong commitment in their mind that they want us because it's a big amount of money that they're giving us. Um, so it qualifies the customer, it requires a commitment from them. They're committed to us because they've given us a lot of money. But it also establishes you as a professional. You know, I mean, how many of us would care about owning a Mercedes Benz if it cost the same amount of money as the cars we're driving now? <laughs> we don't have a Mercedes. I mean, you know. I like my car just fine. I'd sure like to have a, well, actually I'd like to have a BMW. But I really wouldn't care about a BMW if it didn't cost so much, you know. Um, I wouldn't care about certain designers' clothes if they didn't cost so much. But just by being expensive or by requiring a lot of money up front, you just are kind of telling them that, hey, I'm worth it. And you're establishing yourself as a real professional or a real upper class kind of studio. Then, after we've got that 50% down, we get the balance of our money at the pre-wedding conference, where they come in a week ahead of time. Um, a photographer once asked me, he says, how do you get those brides to come in for that conference? Or they say, oh, I'm too busy, I can come in, I'll see you at the wedding. Well, if they've got to come in and bring me a check, they got to come in. So we get the balance of the pre-wedding conference. So 100% of their minimum order is paid for before we ever even show up at the church. They never ordered anything yet? They haven't ordered anything yet. 100%. You better believe that they've paid for everything else in advance. So why shouldn't I get my money up front too? The other thing, that anything that's paid for before the ceremony, usually mommy and daddy pay for. Anything after the ceremony, almost always, the couple pays for. So the more money I can get out of mom and dad's pocket, the more money is left in the bride and groom's pocket for me to get afterwards. You know, because they're not thinking about that big chunk of money that mommy and daddy already gave me. They're just thinking about how much money they are going to spend. Okay, by dividing it in half, it kind of breaks up the payments. It does, you know, break it up for them so it's not all at once. Um, it, like I said, it forces them to parents to come in. They know that they have to spend that much money with you yes. when they order their food. Right. In their mind, they've already spent it because I've already got it. It's the same theory as there's a lot of people on the circuit that tell you that when they check the previews out, they should give you a check for the price of the previews at that time, and then that can apply to the order. But in their mind, they've already bought the previews, so that's a good way to sell the previews. Well, I've never done that, but it's the same kind of idea. Money spent is money forgotten. Okay, then the next thing is if you get all that 100% of that money in advance, your attitude towards somebody taking pictures over your shoulder is, is a lot better. Because I don't care if Uncle Harry's snapping pictures over my shoulder because I already got all my money anyway. The bride, she's already committed to spend that much. You know, Uncle Harry taking a picture over my shoulder is not going to save her 
his niece any money because she's already paid me. Now, the thing that I never used to believe when I listened to speakers was they'd say, well, the more money you charge, the less problems you have. And you get less of people taking pictures over your shoulder and less drunk people. I never believed that, but it really is true. You know, we have very few problems with drinking anymore. We have very few problems with late. He's pacing over here saying, Holly, hurry up. <laughs> Either that or he waiting to get in the bathroom one of the two. But I have very few problems with, of those kinds of things. The more you charge, the less you have of those problems. Um, if they object to this, we have a, a studio policy of satisfaction guarantee. If after the wedding they are not happy with their wedding previews, all they've got to do is bring in every single preview. I will get rid of them and give them their money back. Now see what that does? You know, when they realize they're not going to have any wedding pictures, well, maybe. I've never had to do this, but if somebody questions it about paying everything in advance, I say, well, you know we have a satisfaction guarantee policy. And if you're not happy, all you have to do is give me the pictures back and I will refund everything. You know, so it is, if you have an objection, that's the way that you can handle it. Um, a, a, a way to do this and not get an objection is that you, um, you phrase it as a benefit to the bride to tell her, well, you know, if you pay for an advance, then you don't have to worry about it. It's all taken care of after the wedding and, and you've got it all paid for and you don't have to pay me any more money. Lie, 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 because you can order another $400 worth, but, you know, that's the idea. Um, I know I have one more thing I want to tell you. Oh, the last thing and probably the thing that, that really saved my attitude on weddings is when the bride comes in to place her order and she's ordering her extra three or four hundred dollars and her mom's prints and her mother-in-law's prints and Aunt Maple's prints and the maid of honor and all those orders, those are all paid for at that time. So before the negatives ever go to the lab, everything is 100% paid in full. And do I make any exceptions? No, I do not. Never, ever, ever. It just sits there. If she comes in to um, place the order and she says, well, I don't have the money for my mother-in-law yet, I'll say, fine, I'll just put everything in the whole basket and tell her, drop me a check in the mail. When it gets her, we'll mail it off. The secret to make this work, again, is to phrase it as a benefit. I tell the bride, you know, it'd really be depressing if once your album was ready, you couldn't pick it up because Aunt Mabel, who went back to New Mexico, still owes $40, and it would be even sadder if you had to pay that $40 out of your pocket in order to be able to get your print. And if you collect from them in advance, then you can make me the bad guy. Just like, don't tell Mark this, or not Mark, don't tell Linda this, but don't you guys blame everything on the lab? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, well, what are you going to do with these extra proofs that I just buy? Well, we're going to sell them back to our lab and make recycle them for the silver cup. <laughs> no, like, well, why can't I get this special free wall portrait if I take a month to bring my previews back? Well, it's a special from the lab and they only allow us two weeks and so, <laughs> you know. So I, I don't tell them that, but it's the same thing. I say, you know, you can blame it on me and you can make me the bad guy. And I say, that way it's all collected in advance and you don't have to worry about it. When your album's ready, all you have to do is come in and pick it up. So um, one of the things that this did for me was, I mean, we're still, we've been in business 10, 11 years, and I don't know if there will ever come a point when I can afford to have an order sitting on the shelf that owes me $500 and it takes them a month to come in. I mean, you know, especially, think about it this way. You photograph the wedding in July, the end of, let's say the end of July, it's probably the first week in August when the previews come back. The bride checks them out, she has them for three weeks or a month, so it's the first part of September. You send the order to the lab, the prints come back in two weeks, but our letter takes six weeks. So we're talking about October. You know, that's not when I need money. I got plenty of money in October. You know, thank God for senior season. I need money back in July. We're out in North Latin Breast, but we're not doing seniors yet. You know, our seniors don't come till September. So when I need my money, it's back at the beginning, you know. So anyway, it, it, what happens is you don't sit there and go, oh, my God, I missed something funny. But... Oh, you need rest <laughs> Will you reimburse me if I send you all my art leather pages and maps that I have in stock? Will you trade this for a total number of them? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
no delay in picking up the orders. When I call the bride that her order's ready, she comes and gets it. Ooh, I got hurry. Um, I no longer get called from a right, irate bride's mother. It's always the bride's mother that calls me up and yells at me because her daughter can't have her album because her new blanky blank mother-in-law hasn't paid for hers yet. Um, I also have no longer do they change their minds after the negatives are at the lab and say, well, I can't afford to spend that much. And it also, like I said, gives me better cash flow. But anyway, I have like seven more note cards we could talk about, but I better let Keith talk some. Not that I ever, not that I ever do let Keith talk, but there's always virtual. Just a Um, in the back of your little handout, too, there's things that like our wedding price list. And then there's this little thank you note that's sent over. Yeah. Is it my turn? Yeah. It's my turn, and therefore, Mike, I want you to lock the door back there so they can't leave. We're going to give you a five minute break for the restroom. And uh, how late do you want to go tonight? Okay. I think <laughs> no, it's, it's, let's see, it is uh, 940, 936, excuse me. Um, it's alright, we wind up going till 10, 15, 10, 30, 11, 12. Just talk real fast. Okay. Let's let you go ahead and take four or five minutes. We're going to fight the tractor over here. Yeah. Let's go for the break. First off, my question for you is, how many of you have ever woke up on a Saturday morning or when you're packing equipment for a wedding, felt like, dang, this is another wedding, I really don't want to do this right now, I'd rather be doing something else. Anybody ever felt that way? Probably go tell. Okay. My personal question for you is, would you want somebody to come and photograph your wedding with that attitude? Can they do the best job or what you would like them to do if they don't want to be there? To me, that's fairly important. <laughs> um, hopefully, it's their only wedding. And my feelings are that uh, we need to try to make it their dream come true as much as we possibly can. They've been dreaming of this wedding for, in the bright days, usually years. And they are not expecting to see reality. You know, in other words, I don't believe they want to see close-ups, head and shoulders of the bride with a normal lens, no soft focus, zips, sweat, everything else. That's not part of what they're envisioning. Therefore, we need to change that a little bit. Um, to do that, I feel that we need to prepare ourselves begin with before we ever get to that wedding, prepare ourselves mentally. Uh, I'm going to steal a little bit right now from Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill. This is really strong. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of the emotions constitute a magnetic force which attracts other similar and related thoughts. Okay? If that happens, which it does, you can literally make or break your wedding before you ever get there. If you have a bummed out attitude, everybody picks up on that. How much cooperation are you going to get at that wedding? It's just not there. If you go into that wedding with a pumped up, this is going to be the best thing we can possibly do, you've got a real warm, fuzzy attitude, thanks to Chuck Lewis, um, you're, you're going to constitute a lot of cooperation from your people. You've got the cooperation there, that builds you in time. If you've got cooperation in time, you have the basis for creativity. Everything starts to flow in your favor. You can build the type of wedding you want with the attitude when you get there. Um, this, but if you know you're making money in every wedding you go to by doing Holly's 
you know, schedule here and, and knowing how much money, bottom line, you're going to make with the standard plan. It helps you to enjoy what you're doing. To me, it is hard to get pumped up and excited about doing something that you're either A, not sure you're going to break even, or B, you know, you're spending eight, out of eight nine hours at the wedding and uh, have no idea where, where the sales are going to be. I'd rather spend that with my family. Or doing board stuff. Or doing board stuff, you know. Um, part of what helps keep us um, excited about wedding photography is we put limits on ourselves. You can limit yourself however you want to. And it also helps to, uh, a limit will help build yourself to whatever pricing uh, stratum you're at. You can say you're going to do no more than 360 weddings a year if you want to. Um, I posted one a day. Um, to me, I want to limit it so that I continue to enjoy wedding photography. The same time she went through the pricing change was the same time I was getting burned out and you would hear me driving down the road instead of saying, gee, I want to just do that wedding and thank God I'm not doing that wedding. And that's the wrong attitude. I can't do the type of work I'm showing the couples if I walk into that church with that attitude. The attitude adjustment needs to go carry over to our assistant, which is Holly. Um, but if you're taking an assistant with you, they need to or she needs to have that same attitude. Because you'll start and you'll work together. If a problem does come up, the two of you are sharing the problem and it's really easy to keep yourself pumped up. Um, an assistant, I'm not going to delve into assistants a lot. I think they're very, very important smooth for you and to also increase your uh, attention for the details like uh, straight bow ties and the flowers lined up and, and all the, the extra things, but we'll catch that in just a little bit. The uh, main thing to developing a style is having a good attitude and trying to do the best possible job that you can do in the situation. I started to say this a little bit earlier, I do not feel that you can do kind of work that we would like to see with the normal lenses on the head and shoulder stuff. I just don't believe that that's what they are, are expecting. So what we have done is we take, well let me back up, how many of you that are doing wedding photography have the 150 or a portrait length lens in the case for bringing the ceremony closer to the uh, camera? How many of you use it for head and shoulders? That sounds good. Okay. That's what I was doing, <clears throat> trying to figure out why am I carrying this sucker along. I am doing something at a wedding I would never do in a camera room. It's very rare I'll pull an 80 millimeter out in a camera room. It's very rare that I will do straight lens work in the camera room. Therefore, when we come in at a wedding and we start doing the head and shoulders work, I use the 150 lens, I use the vignettes, I use the soft focus, and it just makes a difference. We use a portrait background in our wedding, so if you went through the books, you'll see that. The main reason for that, if I've got a really nice look at church that has a good area to work in, I will use it. But I would assume you've got some of those here in Omaha. We don't have them in Omaha. Um, I do have some pictures of our churches that I haven't planned on showing them to you, but our best looking churches have church basement green block walls to work with, um, things that just do not add to the portraits at all. You know, green colors are real fun to work with the skin tones. Uh, Linda left, so I can't ask what she's doing with color balance. <coughs> uh, you, know, you just can't do it with distractions back there. So by having, a, by having a portrait background with me, I don't have to worry about the distracting lines created by those folding wooden uh, dividers, or posters on the walls, or all the little things. I've got control of the situation. We take multiple lighting with us to our weddings. It is a photogenic Portamaster 400, with a white umbrella on it. Um, this combination of the multiple lighting and the portrait lens work is one of the things that will set your style apart. If you have a couple come into the, ceremony, or into the studio to look at weddings, or a bride or mom or whatever, 
and they sit down and start flipping through books, they aren't going to know what the difference is, but they will see it. At that point, I do educate them as to what our differences are, that we do take this lighting. We have, in the first two slides that I'll pop up here in terms of the slides, are in the studio in 11 by 14. The on-camera flash is what I refer to as fat light. I got that from Bill Brown. Reason for that is if you've got one light source on camera straight over the lens, what's going to happen to the face? It becomes very round because you filled all the shadow detail in. If you've got a second light over here that you're using as a main light like you would in the studio, you're adding the third dimension with shadow. What happens to the lace work detail on the dress if you've got an on-camera flash where there's no shadow detail worked into that lace? It flattens out. You can use your umbrella over here and pop it across. You're throwing a little bit of shadow at each of those little creases, and it brings out the detail. Same thing goes with the cake table. All that little detailing in the white frosting with an on-camera flash is blown away. If you start pointing this stuff out to them, and every album they look at after that is going to look deader than dog. I have had people tell me that before I start talking to them, that they, they can see a difference and not know what it is. Therefore, that's my argument to the photographers to tell me that the, the customer doesn't know the difference, why should I do the extra work? Also, I wasn't going to talk about assistants too much, but when you have an assistant along, they're helping you share the work and make it easier. Um, what I would like to do, if we could right now, is, is there a way we can kill some of these lights? And let's go ahead and run some comparisons.
That should not be there. We should not have the distortion factor. If you start looking at your shoulders, I mean, that's the same basic body position. Just changing cameras. That's all we were doing there. And I think I did change his hands and stuff like that. The same basic body position. You start looking at the distortion. Look how large this guy's shoulder is out there. And the fall off in there. It just, it, it does not do him or the bride's justice. What's going on back here? Oh, you're getting me clicky? Oh, okay. Um, this is the way. This is the bottom. No. So that's the top one. Oh, it's the bottom. <laughs> okay, same basic difference again between uh, uh, on camera. Another thing I'll point out is start to look at the, the shadow underneath his chin from the on camera flash versus what happens when you use the umbrella. Now, what we are doing in all of these situations is I am using a 283 on camera tipped up to the ceiling to bounce off, helps throw, uh, fill a little light on the background, which also blows away the shadows that come up on the background. The 400 is running roughly 45 degrees off camera, 35, 45 degrees off camera. Right. 
at the top up here versus bouncing off the feeling to get that detail of the frosting. Okay, this is a little trick that we learned long, I think I learned this from Benny a long time ago. But if you have the stained glass windows in the front of the churches for the ceremonies and that type of thing, and they always blow out, you know, when you drop your exposure for the ceremony. Um, those of you that have seen me do this before, this is a one stop. This is two stops. <laughs> All you do is in front of your lens shade, Put your finger down, the depth of field push, and figure out where that stained glass window is and knock the light out of it. I mean, hair off, etc. But you can see how you can pull that stained glass window down to a fourth of four versus also, letting it blow away. There's another example of dropping it in. Just dropping your finger right down the middle will block it off. You're picking up enough of the image around your finger. Sure, it'll more loose. Than, yeah, more than four. You can't see what's out there. Okay, all right. This actually makes it a four to five six. Okay. You know, it's like burning and dodging the dark. Right. right. All right. <laughs> Your, your memory of little things that happen 
in the therapy. And that's what they want to see in the pictures. Yo. Do you use, I think, the other no, BPS three. I like the warm feel. Uh, different surgeons will photograph differently. Uh, some of them are very natural, some of them are real warm. Uh, but no, if it's a real warm one, I might go to 400 because it doesn't record so much memory of that. Our lab is computerized, and they have it in their little thing in the bottom, which is called yeah. that a bias, a built-in bias. Table. 
and put them out of focus back there. Uh, and then maybe back it off instead of being real tight on the bride and groom at the, the altar, back off and show a little bit of what they've got for wall, uh, wall, the altar decor. Same basic thing, looking for the transition pages. The, the champagne deal we held up a little bit ago, but it's a good transition page from, from uh, leading into your, your reception. And like this page in the book becomes like, they left the wedding and right before they go into the reception, you know, because they have pictures that are leaving in the carriage and then there's that picture and then so, you know, it's kind of the reception of the next. And then the next chapter. And those are just more champagne things that we've done. You will get kind of unusual looks when you start gathering up champagne corks and flying all over the place. The reason we did the one with the champagne cork is I got hit in the rear end of the champagne cork. Yeah, and 200 bottles of champagne. Okay, this is a uh, guest book shot outside the ceremony. You know, it's easy things if you just let your, your eyes see some of the neat things. Uh, one of the, the points I like to bring out is try to pre plan a little bit on your ceremonies uh, ahead of time. Our goal is two different poses or two different ideas at every wedding. Now, if we're doing 20 weddings a year, that means at the end of the year I have a potential 40 new ideas. That helps keep my attitude up because when you try something different or you get excited about doing something unique in the camera, you always get wound up and charged up. And that's the thing that helps me keep my attitude up and excited to see the wedding pictures come back. Also, you can honestly you know, make good comments to the bride and groom about why I can't wait for your wedding previews come back. But if you're doing the same thing every day, yeah? Is there a chair sheet or something that you give the bride and groom to let them know what shots you're going to no. take during the wedding or that they suggest or that okay. they would like? Um, the question was, is there a chair sheet that we give them? No, we don't. Um, I used to have a checklist that we'd work off of. Three things happen. One, if you have a parachute or a checklist and they have marked something that you do not photograph it, you are legally liable. If they mark it, you have to take it. The other thing that happens if you give them a checklist, I have found that they will mark it all no matter what. Whether it's in their coverage or not, they will still mark it. And the third thing that happened when I had a checklist was my weddings were looking the same all the time. You know, I'm doing pose two, pose four, pose, you know, you know I, and there, you lose that creativity. What we do is in our pre-wedding conference, we'll sit down with the books, and we go through, and I just make notes on what they like, and I ask a lot of questions like, who's in the wedding, and, and are there any special friends or any special um, honorary grandparents, or, you know, all the details that I can find out. My information sheet's just full of all kinds of notes. And that's what we do our building off of. Whether they're like traditional field to the portraits groups or more of a candid or informal grouping. Oh, um, and in that way, and I explain it to them in that direction too. This way, I try to customize their album as much as possible and fit their specific style. Oh, um, another thing that we do, and I don't know how many of you like double exposures, <clears throat> but if I'm going to do a double exposure, I want it to have a meeting for two images so I want to see the film. Uh, I get real tired of double exposures that are just that. A double exposure, and then, I mean, uh, one image and another image that really don't go together on one print. And an example of what I mean, and these are kind of old ones, but they're good ones, the ceremony inside of the church. Me, you know, the church, it was the wedding was in, what the day was like in the ceremony. There's a reason for it. The couple looking down on the ceremony, this goes back to my own wedding. That's kind of the way I felt. It was like, you know, we've been planning this thing for so long and, and the songs were going on and they seemed to stretch on forever. And it was like we were up in the balcony watching this thing. You know, it had a meaning for me. To do a 150 over an 80 of the ceremony has no meaning to me. To do uh, the ceremony in uh, overexposed clouds has no meaning for me. I, you know, I just, I, I've got to have a reason 
to do it. Uh, what we'll tell couples in the pre-wedding conference a lot of times is when we're trying to customize this and, and ask you questions, some couples don't care for double exposures and others maybe really like business. If they don't care for something, there's no reason for me to spend time in that area. Let's put it in the things they do like. Part of what I just told them also is double exposures are out. <laughs> Oh, back up here. Thank you. Yo. Does that more or less cover then in your full coverage that you would just give them just about everything? Full coverage? Or, yeah. Or, yeah, I'll, whatever they basically want, but it's still on what their style is. Full coverage is uh, I get there when they want me to be there, and I leave when they tell me to leave on that day. <laughs> and we can do the bride at her house, and the groom at his house, and then at the church, you know, whatever they want is the full coverage. The plan right below that's a five hour coverage, can include dance, two locations, you know, outdoors, all that kind of stuff. And the standard plan is a four hour coverage, two locations. And so they're buying, you know, basically how much coverage they want and what type of things they want. Our best sales come from the middle plan. Right. Take the bride purchase top of the line plan with no guarantee that they're going to stay. You, you would stay then the dollar dance or the cutting of the cake? Um, on the, five, the standard plan that has dance coverage? Either you know. or. They, they never know when they're going to get done with the dollar dance or when they're going to do the dollar oh, dance. Or okay. If it doesn't happen, it's a time limit, we don't do it. Right. Or they can pay us to be extra time. Either way. Dollar dance I don't do a lot of. No. You know, that's later in the dance, and, and in all honesty, when you photograph it, how many of you have actually sold very many prints for a dollar dance? Yeah. Dance yeah. coverage that you're going to sell is the bride and groom dancing the first dance, the bride with her mom, and I mean her dad, the groom with the bride's mom, and, you know, and vice versa, you know, that, that series of family dances and a few candidates, that's what's going to sell. That's done within the five hours. Usually. Yeah. If their dance isn't going to start within the five hours, I have a wedding coming up, um, in October, and the bride's going with the top of the line plan because her five hours is going to be up at 8.30 and her dance is not scheduled to begin until 9, which we all know that means it's going to start at 10. And so she wants that, and even though we would normally include dance coverage, it doesn't come, the dance is not going to start within that five hours. So for her to get to stay for the dance, she has to go to the top of the line. So for weddings to count, we split up. No. It's from when I am supposed to arrive to when you. Okay, so that's the same about two days. Yeah, you know, if we split it up, then we've got a babysitter for the full time for us. And one the other. Job, we just need to laugh. Yeah. You know, it's that mental, mental preparation again that you can pump yourself up. And at least for us, I get myself up on an adrenaline run. And when I sit down and come down, it takes some time to pull it back up. That's another reason I only do one wedding a day now. I have done five weddings in one weekend. And by the last one, since she had not been there, I wouldn't have made it up. But, you know, receiving like to sit down and get bored, I, I was gone. We always figured that a wedding takes us two days to photograph, basically, because we photograph the wedding on Saturday and basically the whole weekend. We don't do anything on Saturday except for the ground. Gotcha. So we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not Anyway, again, what I'm saying, you know, watch for some details, you know, look for some different angles and so on. Um, the bride's flowers in her hat when she was doing that first dance down there. I could have done the, oh, I did do the, the first dance very traditionally. And then um, picked up something like this. just has some depth and feeling to it. Um, earlier in the reception, this is now outdoor reception, you can't tell. <laughs> she had kicked off her shoes as the maid of honor, so they also left shoes and the bride's half of way there and everything else. All I did was change a little bit of the shoes just to give me a little more of a line instead of as much as a plump look. And uh, had something that's a little different from what we need to get. And they never used to buy that stuff until we started including the album and including the layout sheet. And now they can see where it fits into telling the story, and so now they're buying that kind of stuff. When we were just selling individual prints, they weren't. Basically, I'm almost done with my, my little recursive slides field here, but this is another reason that you may want to include a vignette with you when you go to weddings. Is when the bride's mom you have is out, the paramedics are working on her in the front row during the ceremony, you can knock it down just a little bit so it's, it's not quite so prominent. 